Hey guys, welcome back. It's your favorite GIMP with a limp and I am here with something I know many of you are very, 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 very excited to see and that of course is the prototype play, uh, play copy of DVG's new game, getting ready to hit Kickstarter, Valkyrie, that is a mech warrior type game and I gotta say, I love prototype copies. It's, it's kind of like having an affair. You know you're not supposed to be doing it. You know you're not supposed to be playing with it, but you just can't help but run your hands all over the interesting pieces that you're not supposed to be touching. Ah, I love this stuff. All right, so like I said, I know you guys are looking forward to seeing this. I'm going to do a whole series on it. This first video is just going to be a nice static camera overview of all the different components, the basics of gameplay, that type of stuff. Uh, after that, we're going to do a playthrough, let you guys see how the game itself is going to play out. And then we'll finish up with some uh, some comments about how the campaign system works, because there is a, of course, full-on campaign system for the game as well, and some final thoughts. Do keep in mind, though, since it is prototype that all of these components are prototype pieces, some of them might be what you'd be looking to receive there at the end. Some of them won't be. Uh, some of the stuff is 3D printed. Some of the counters are homemade. Don't take that as a indication of, you know, final piece quality when it comes to uh, the components on the game. Keep in mind, all of it's prototype. It's all, you know, basics. This is the starter and we're getting ready to get into the, uh, the high end stuff. Like I said, you can tell by some of this terrain here. Let me zoom in. Uh, the pieces, I don't know what color they're going to be when you guys get them. I've actually painted these up myself so they would look a little better on the board. So we've got pieces like this, like the hills or craters. And I really like these, the trees, because they've got, uh, you know, miniature little trees on there that look all cool. And then uh, there's space to put the minis where they go for whatever hex that they're in. So that's awesome and then these are lakes so pretty much prohibitive terrain there's some vehicles that can go into it but generally prohibitive terrain and there's other types of terrain that are going to be included or add-ons or stretch goals to the game as well besides just the types of terrain that you guys see here uh, there's going to be uh, buildings power plants bunkers and all that type of stuff as well like I said, I only have this terrain, so you'll just see the, the prototype pieces that I have so far. Now, the big thing I know you guys want to see are the mechs themselves, because the, the premise of the game is mech-type combat. There are, of course, still armored fighting vehicles, tanks, uh, artillery pieces, infantry. All those are still going to be in the game, but the big, big, big selling point, of course, is the mechs, which I got to say, even as prototype pieces that I got for the miniatures, they're still pretty damn good in detail for uh, for prototype copies. I'm not sure how the final pieces are going to look exactly, if they're going to be similar to this or not, but I got to say for the pieces that I've received so far, these are excellent. So this is actually the Timberwolf for the American Silent Let me grab a few more. There's this one as well. This is like a... Uh, um, Damn, I can't remember the name in Mech Warrior, the one that has the missile launchers for arms, but it's like one of those, of course, big, large missile launchers for arms, so it can fire a whole bunch of stuff. There is limited ammo for some of these guys, so this one would have limited ammo when it comes to its long-range missiles. We also have some smaller ones. We've got some units that have flames or artillery cannons, shoulder-mounted rockets, lasers, medium lasers, heavy lasers, heavy cannons, medium cannons. So there's multiple different types of units that have multiple different types of power settings, which we'll touch on power settings here in just a minute, and uh, multiple different types of weapon systems. So I really, really like how the minis are coming out. Let me show you for the Russian units as well, some of theirs. The Each nation tends to have a different uh, type of unit uh, for its mechs, so the Americans tend to be more uh, or have higher levels of technology and things like that. The Russians seem to be big, brutish mechs that have armor and big weapons and long-range stuff. So this one is the Baba Yaga. It's actually one that you're going to see in the coming playthrough. has a artillery cannon on the shoulder. I hate that thing. It was chewing me apart in the uh, playthrough game that I've been doing. 
because I've been playing this thing a lot actually off camera. I wanted to make sure I was really on point with it uh, before I showed it to you guys. But man, he's been crushing me with that thing. Uh, has a flamethrower as well and then a heavy cannon. Uh, like I said, you guys will see what all the stats are. I'm getting ready to grab up the sheets for these guys. I just wanted you to see the miniatures because it is so awesome how these guys have come out already, even as just prototype copies. I am highly pleased with these guys because you can paint them, you can prime them up. I haven't done anything like that for these guys just yet. I'm going to wait until I get the final pieces to decide what I'm going to uh, do as far as painting them, but I am definitely going to paint them up so they look a little better on the table, but you don't have to. You can do it whichever way you want. So I've got four mechs for each side, the Russians and then the Americans, and let me grab up some of the smaller vehicles uh, to show you guys here. We've got like an armored fighting vehicle, AFV, a Paladin, I think is called, the mobile, um, mobile artillery gun, and then of course M1 Abrams tanks. And the storyline of the game, I remember one of the things they stated is when it came to vehicle combat, that they had pretty much reached the zenith of what they could create. Like the M1 tank was the best design that they could come up with. So they might have, you know, improved computers and better cannons or whatever as technology increased over the decades but the simple design of the tank itself was so good that they really couldn't improve upon it any further than that. That's why you're seeing mechs and M1 tanks and Paladin artillery and IFV fighting vehicles. So we've got those. And then of course we've got a few tiny little infantry guys. And these guys are, let me see if I can get real close for you guys. They're supposed to be uh, wearing like little mech suits, but they're so tiny that you're trying to represent them on the board. Uh, it's hard to to show that, but I think these guys are just freaking awesome because they can be carried by some of the uh, the fighting vehicles. They can be carried and then dropped out on the board. They don't have like far range or anything, but they can get you extra intel dice or or um, uh, camouflage stuff like that. So real cool having the infantry in the game as well. All right, really quickly, I want to show you the stats for the smaller vehicles, and then we'll go over the stats for the mechs themselves. Each one of the units is going to have a card associated with it, and it's going to depend whether or not the unit is AI or player controlled on what information it's going to have. You're going to have the point cost, the supply cost, there in the top right of the card. It's armor factor, which you have to meet or beat with your penetration when it comes to making an attack against them. You'll see that when we get into combat. So, of course, you know, this one has one, but you're M1 tank, that's going to have two, so you need to have at least two penetration rolls. Uh, Pallet only has one, and the infantry have none because they don't have as much armor. But to the left, and this is the interesting system, this is what I really have come to like when it comes to this game, is the dice when it comes to your systems. So you have this many dice that you can use during a unit's activation. So you'll activate a striker and that gives you four dice that you can use to attack, move, get intel, things like that. So you see the max attack for this unit is two dice. So you could put two dice towards an attack and two dice towards movement, or you could do three dice towards movement and one dice towards intel, but that's how it's gonna work. You're gonna have that many dice when the unit activates and you can spread them throughout your different systems however you like and the different units are going to have different systems. Like your Paladin here, it's got long range attack. It can put three dice towards its attack if it wants to and it can also do indirect fire. Indirect fire means it's not blocked by different types of terrain that blocked line of sight. So let me show you guys the, the dice real quick actually. And there's your infantry. You see they only get a couple of dice. They don't have very good attacks, but they can also get you intel. They can camouflage. They do have two defensive dice inherently though, which is kind of nice. All right, so I'm mentioning the dice and these are some of the different types of dice that you're gonna see in the game. Your green are gonna be like your evasion. So your defensive dice, blue for movement, red for attack. You've got the yellow for your intel. 
And this is what I'm talking about. You'll have so many dice that you can use for whatever unit, and this goes for your mechs as well. They have power involved with theirs, but like I said, we'll touch on that in a sec. So for like for our attack dice, and you can tell prototype here that they're still finalizing it because some of these have uh, different results taped onto them or glued onto them. And it's because they were play testing the different results for all the different dice rolls and kind of changing and adjusting as they were play testing. But of course, the little explosion symbol, that's a hit. The arrow looking symbol, that's penetration. So when you're rolling an attack, however many red attack dice that you're rolling, you'll need to equal the armor value of whatever you're firing at or beat it. And then however many hits you get on that roll is the damage that's going through that can be mitigated by the green dice when it comes to their defense. Movement dice are really cool because you can have multiple uh, arrows as results that give you a lot of hexes. So it gives you a little uh, variety when it comes to your movement that you don't know for sure. You can, hey, I can risk rolling one die. I might get a good result and get three arrows and get a lot of movement for just one movement die or just one system die being spent. Or you can end up not lucking out. You only get one and you're not moving quite as far. Also, when it comes to making attacks, when you're attacking a mech, you're going to use these dice to determine where that damage is actually going to be applied. I think that's a real neat system as well. And that's going to be for each damage. So say you get three damage on an attack, you're going to roll one of these dice for each one of those damage and apply it to the mech accordingly. Now, I mentioned that there were different cards for the different units depending on if they were AI controlled or if they were player controlled. These are the same types of units, just the Russian units. So you see armored fighting vehicle, T-80, so their tank, their infantry, and their self-propelled gun. But this is the AI card version of that. So you see it has different information on it. It tells you what type of force it is. This is a maneuver force. And that'll come into play when we're going through the AI cards. It'll tell you what types of forces perform what types of actions and then how many dice they're gonna roll at whatever range they're conducting their attack, how many movement dice they get to roll when they are making a movement, and the cards will tell you generally where they're trying to go. Any special uh, abilities will be listed down below. And then obviously this one, since it's a carrier, will carry infantry and they can get deployed as well. They do have the same stats as player cards when it comes to their supply cost and armor values. See if there's anything else. No. For the most part, they're generally the same as your cards, with the exception that they don't get system dice. They just get told how many dice and what type of dice they're rolling by the AI cards. Now, this, of course, is the really awesome stuff when we start getting into it. This is one of the player sheets for uh, this mech, actually, the Timber, uh, timber Wolf. And you can see starting at the top left, this is its power supply, and that's how much power it can apply to all of its different uh, systems. The top right is its nation, so American for the Temple Wolf, and its uh, supply cost, so 50 supply to get this mech. And so when you're looking at all the other systems that are listed down, that's where you're going to get into using your power to activate the different systems. So just real quickly, you'll see this when we go into actually playing the game, but let's say our Timber Wolf here activated, it could choose to activate whatever systems, like say its left arm or right arm or its legs for movement or you know weapons, its missile rack, and you would take that many power cubes, which are little prototype green power cubes here, and you would move them down up to the max limit that is listed down in the circle itself. So like for its Intel dice, it could roll up to four, or if it was making an attack with its heavy cannon here, it could roll up to three when firing its left arm. So let's say as an example that we spent three power for our activation, and activated this left arm to fire the heavy cannon and make an attack. For each power cube that you choose, because this is the max, not the half to. So you could spend one, two, or three power cubes here, and for each cube, you get that many dice. So if we spent three power cubes in our left arm for this heavy cannon, we would get three of the red attack dice 
to roll when it came to making that attack. And you'll see, depending on the range, you can have other modifiers that apply, as in for this heavy cannon, if we attack at four range, we lose one penetration, but if we attack at a short range, we actually gain one penetration. And a lot of the weapons have different stats that can be affected, whether it's extra hits or penetration. You also have, like up here at the top, if it says indirect fire, it's similar to the artillery, the paladin, and the fact that it's not blocked by line of sight blocking type terrain, can fire over top of it. So it's got a little small missile rack up here on its shoulder. And again, you could spend up to however many power cubes you want for that many attack. But if you have something like this that says expend after it, then you lose ammo cubes. And that's what this is symbolized by over here to the right. So this has four ammo cubes when it starts its uh, starts the attack in the scenario and each time you perform an attack and that doesn't matter how many power cubes you put there if you put just one and roll one attack die it's still going to cost you an ammo but if you put three power there and fire you know getting more attack dice you're still just spending the one so for something like that it behooves you to spend the extra power down over here to our bottom right, the miscellaneous, uh, some uh, generalities when it comes to the AI will cause power to be put there, or if you're activating this unit and you don't want to do anything, you can just move one power cube over there, kind of if you're doing a stall or something that, uh, to that effect. When it comes to your legs, you just have a single uh, spot here because you're using both legs to move. But you'll notice it doesn't have a max cube number in there and that's because it's listed down in between the legs and this is actually a real neat system the more damage that the legs take the less movement dice that you're actually allowed to move up to the fact that you can't move at all if the legs are destroyed so here at the top these uh squares that have numbers in them are the damage locations where you will take in place these red cubes as you take damage. Well, once these are filled up, you no longer can have three movement dice, you can only have two. So the highest number that isn't filled up with damage is how many your max dice is for the movement. I really like how they did that. Now, as we're talking about damage locations, these numbers that are in there are the armor values for these locations. And you'll always start your top and work your way down. So the leg armor starts at two, so you need two penetrations, two of those arrows on the attack roll to be able to beat the armor and cause a damage cube to be applied to it. But as they take damage, the armor goes down, it'll go down to one, and then eventually they'll be destroyed. When we're looking at the core, oh, and let me go ahead and mention, say you have a section that's blown off, like your left arm is blown off, completely destroyed, any further damage coming into that left side is applied directly to the core so keep that in mind now when it comes to the core same principles apply you've got your armor values but you'll notice that the uh, lower numbers have negative numbers right next to them and that's actually how much power you lose when you have damage applied down into that level so if i had damage all the way down into here i'd be losing up to two to three to four and then destroy when it comes to your power, which you do get back at the beginning of each round. Once a damage cube is applied to the core, the uh, mech, I keep wanting to call these things uh, uh, Jaegers. God, that movie is like stuck in my head. I keep uh, thinking to myself like, don't say Jaeger, don't say Jaeger, <laughs> don't say Jaeger, because it's not a Jaeger, it's a mech, you know, but if you guys hear me say Jaeger, it's just stuck in my head. But yeah, once you get a uh, damage cube into your core, the mech blows up. And now just to show you very quickly the other mech for uh, the Russian side that you guys are going to see. You see it's got a little bit higher point cost. This thing has a buttload of power with 15. It was crushing me with all that power. A lot of spaces to take damage. The big thing that was crushing me with this guy was his artillery cannon up on his shoulder. Because he could fire that thing from a distance and he damn sure was firing it from a distance. Blatting out my stuff off the board. Uh, also, one thing I did forget to mention on the other one, you'll see that uh, they have these different types of nomenclature, for lack of a better word, listed down. And this actually comes into play when you're doing your campaign, because there are different types of forces and battle groups. We'll talk about that in the campaign, but you'll generally have 
a Valkyrie with so many supporting units like tanks and uh, infantry fighting vehicles. <clears throat> and it, the Valkyrie will be commanding it and they'll be moving around the map. Now also when it comes to Valkyries, you will have the ability to apply pilots to them just like you would see in some of the other DVG games. And I like that they've included this, but it is not a requirement. You can just assume default pilot and it zero for stats. So basically they don't get any bonuses like power or anything applied to them or any extra skills. Both of these mechs do have a uh, pilot included with them when it comes with the scenario, which I'll show you guys here in just a sec. But for an example, this is the American pilot. The amount of supplies, their skill level, which can increase on a campaign, uh, bailout number. So you can roll to bail out and save the pilot if the mech is destroyed. Now these numbers down here, uh, they're going to apply mostly to the campaign. You can have increased power level for the mech that you're in. So if like this one had power level plus two, as an example, the mech that he was in would have two extra power on top of its listed and then skills can come into it. But we'll touch on the groups and forces when we talk about campaigns. All right, guys, I promise we're getting there. Like I said, this first one's just an overview, touching on uh, the basics of the game. I'm not gonna hit everything, but I'm gonna hit most of it and you'll see the rest of it when we're actually playing the game itself. These are some of the AI cards. It says vehicle at the top, but they will be used for infantry as well. So basically everything but a Valkyrie is gonna operate off of this deck of cards. And what you'll do is you'll look at the top and you'll start at the top and work your way down. And the first unit that can activate whatever it is, so like say you don't have any scouting units, then you'll go to assault. And if you can do this with the assault, that's what you'll do and that will be your activation. So you don't do everything, you'll pick one starting from the top, working your way down, and the first time you have one of those activate, that's gonna be the enemy's activation. But you will do everything that's listed down. So let's say our assault was the one that activated. We would move towards the closest player in a flank. Flank is a specific area here on the map. And uh, move towards the uh, closest player in a flank and you would get one extra movement die. If you did not move, move towards the closest player and then attack the co uh, closest player. So you would start at the top, work your way down, do everything that you can and that finishes out the activation. The Valkyries are going to operate under the same principle that the AI is when it comes to its vehicles. And what you'll do is you'll have a set of decks for your vehicle, set of decks for your Valkyries and you'll draw one from them uh, down the line sequentially. So if you draw for your vehicle this time, you'll draw for your Valkyrie the next time and then you'll go back to your vehicles or to your other Valkyrie, just depending on what units that you have in the game. So you're not gonna be drawing from the same deck each time. You guys will see this when we go into our example of play, but it's not gonna be like the enemy Valkyrie unless that's the only thing they've got left to activate, activating turn after turn after turn they'll do their vehicle, their Valkyrie, their vehicle, their Valkyrie, you know, back and forth. So the Valkyrie also is going to operate top to bottom, doing everything that it can. This one, attack the highest victory point player. If a, if a cannon attack and there are at least five power remaining, pay five power, so this is like an upcharged attack, and it gets a bonus of three dice. This is stuff that the AI is going to do that you're not going to be able to do, unfortunately. All right, something else that we haven't touched on just yet is the fact that your terrain is going to have stats as well. And it's not stats for the terrain, but it's uh, stats that will affect your vehicles and Valkyries. Like trees, as an example. So this type of terrain will have these stats, it blocks line of sight and it's counted as defensive. And that comes into play because there are AI cards that will tell the unit to go towards defensive terrain or go towards offensive terrain. So the units, the different types of terrain have different stats. Some are offensive, some are defensive, some count as both, some block line of sight. But you'll have a card for each type of terrain. And this trees, for example, when it comes to tracked and wheeled vehicles, so not Valkyries, it has plus one movement point to enter, plus one defense die, and minus one attack die. 
foot units have these stats. Like our lakes, Valkyries can't enter them. Non-Valkyries, or <clears throat> excuse me, Valkyries have no effect and non-Valkyries cannot enter the water period. And cra uh, craters, tracked and wheeled, can't enter foot, all their different uh, types of stats that are affecting them. So I like this. You do need to set aside one of the cores for each of the different types of terrain that you will have in the game. And the game is set up in such a way that it mirrors the board. I haven't touched on the board just yet, so let's cover that real quick. You're going to have a support section on each side. That's where your units are going to start or your support units are going to be firing from. So over here is my support section. Over there is the enemy support section. Along each side is the flank. Right? So this set of hexes here and then this set of hexes here. And then in the center, you have what's called the breakthrough. There's a thick white line around each of the areas designating what they are. And the cool part is having control of these areas can affect the game. If you have control of a flank, i.e. you have more of your units in the flank than the enemy does, then your units in the breakthrough get a bonus die when they're conducting an attack. And if you have control of both flanks, then you get two bonus dice. So it behooves you to try to gain control of these flanks. And I, I'm telling you now, the AI cards have the AI moving towards the flanks all the damn time. So you not only have to uh, split your forces, you have to worry about controlling the flanks as best you can and then pushing up the center with that bonus to a attack. So I like how they've done that because you're not going to easily just try to focus your forces, just push them straight up the center and try to, you know, hammer and anvil the enemy because if they just put a small amount on each side, their units are going to start pushing a hell of a lot harder against you with harder hitting attacks because of the bonuses they receive. So you kind of have to spread yourself out a little bit to keep them from gaining control so your units in the center don't get squashed by the extra attacks that they can perform. Also, you guys will see this when we go into our setup for the enemy, but the enemy AI will set up in their support area depending on what type of unit they are. There's like three rows over here in their support. So the farthest row towards the center of the map, that's your assault row, your assault row, and your, let's see here, like your T-80, your assault units will be located in that row. Then the center row is your maneuver row. You'll have the maneuver units like your uh, armor, or IFBs located there. And then your back row is gonna be your support, and that's where you'll have like your artillery located. So that's how the AI is put onto the board, and it's real neat. All you have to do, uh, do is roll a D10, start at the top, count it to the, uh, start at the bottom, work your way to the top, one, two, three, all the way to 10. Roll for them. If they're an assault, they'll be in the front. Uh, maneuver, middle, and then sport back, and the D10 tells you which specific hex they go into. So real simple system for deploying the AI. Like I said, you guys will see that when we set up for our game itself. All right, so let me show you this last little bit here and then we'll get ready to go into our gameplay itself. This is an example of a scenario that you could play as a one-off, as an example. And it tells you a little blurb about the battle and then command the player must command the Russian Federation forces. Now, this one says I have to command the Russian, but I played the, uh, the American forces. Bite me, <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do. It tells you the type of terrain and where it's going to be located for the map. That can be randomly generated or it can be designated on the, uh, the scenario what it's going to be. If, like I said, it's going to be mirrored. So looking at the map, you have different hexes. Where is it? So this one is one, two, this is three, four, where's five, six, five, six, seven, eight. I think there's a nine, 10. Yep, nine, 10 is over here. So there's five different hexes that are designated on the board and they're, <clears throat> they're gonna be mirrored on both sides. So as an example, here's three, four. If there's a lake here in three, four, it doesn't matter how it's oriented, as long as it's one of them's there in three, four, then there's gonna be a lake on this side in three, four. Same when it comes to things like trees. So this tree is in five, six, then there's gonna be a tree on this side in five, six. 
that's how the board is going to be mirrored in such a way to not give either side an advantage when it comes to the combat. So you can't try to block in the enemy or give yourself all the defensive terrain so they get blown apart. Now, just personally speaking, after you've played it and you've got a, a handle on the game, if you wanted to just randomize the terrain, it's your game, you could do it whatever way you want. But I do like how the system is set up that <coughs> that you can't really gain the system because it is going to be mirrored, basically. And like I said, you can rotate the terrain however you like, but it will be in that general area. So we know like 910 is going to have a hill here, and then 910 up here is going to have a hill. And then when we're looking over here at our forces, it tells us our... U.S. Forces, Timberwolf with average pilot, the name, no skills included with that pilot, three uh, Abrams, four Strikers, which are the uh, carrier, infantry carriers, one Paladin, which is your artillery, and then all start with a 2-4 Dust Trail. Dust Trail is something I haven't covered yet, but it's an innovative system that is designed to not only give your units potential defense, but it also lets you know which units you've activated because they have different colors on each side. So if you look down here in our bottom left, there's a battle turn counter, right? And this battle turn counter is black on one side and white on the other. Same with our dust, uh, dust trails. So if it's the white turn and then you flip one over to its black side, you know, hey, I've activated that unit. And then that unit, gets a defensive bonus that's what the two is when it comes to being attacked we'll get into this more specifically when we play it'll be a little hard for me to explain without actually showing you guys just understand your dust trail markers can be used to designate the defense of the unit they go faster they built up a little dust so they're harder to hit and it also helps you designate which units have already been activated the same with our russian units for this scenario they've got their baba yaga with average pilot, no skills, and then the same mirrored uh, units as the U.S. forces, but they do start with one intel cube. A intel cube allows you to add one dice to whatever roll that you're making, and a counter intel cube allows you to remove one dice. You guys will see that when we get into our gameplay. Uh, six turns, initiative is going to be random each turn, and then no special rules and says, oh, no, excuse me, do not check for route. Route has to do with how many points that you have on the board. If you have under a certain limit compared to your opponent, then your forces can route and run off. All right, I know I've been blasting through this very quickly, and I know some of you guys are going, oh, what are you talking about? Game is not hard, trust me. I was a little confused, a couple little things there when I was first getting into it. DVG was nice enough to clarify it. It really is a streamlined game, and I have been having a blast with this thing the past couple of days. We're going to pick up with the start of that scenario that I actually just was showing you guys. I'll have my forces set up, which, like I said, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm taking the U.S. forces just because I want to play the U.S. forces. But if anything, I'm really putting myself at a disadvantage because this Baba Yaga is a beast. It is the biggest mech in the game, most power, and it has that shoulder cannon, which can hit damn near anything on the board it was like crushing me in that uh, uh play game that i've been doing so you guys will see that we'll start off with the setup of the enemy forces so you can see how that's going to work and then the whole dice system activation dust trails all that other cool stuff so you guys stay tuned for that that will be coming very soon y'all take care i'll catch you in the next one